My name is Daisha Clay. I'm the audio librarian here at Classical 91.7. While I'm a real librarian, I have a deep, dark secret. I know very little about classical music. I grew up listening to rock. And I know something about jazz. But when it comes to classical... But I really want to learn. So... Every week on this show, a classical music expert will give me a piece of classical music they think I should know, and then we'll discuss it. Come learn with me in the classical classroom. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the classical classroom. I'm Daisha Clay, and here with me all the way from, gosh, I don't even know where you are. I forgot to ask before we started talking. Where are you, Oystein? <laughs> I'm in Norway. In Norway? <laughs> All the way from Norway uh, via Skype is Oystein Bodsvik, who is a Norwegian tuba soloist and chamber musician. He is the only tuba virtuoso to create a career that is like totally as a soloist, instead of becoming a teacher or orchestra member. He's played with symphony orchestras all over the world. He is actually really well known for his master classes. He records CDs. He works with jazz and rock musicians as well. Oystein, welcome to the program. Thank you very much. What are you going to be teaching me about today? I was hoping to uh, talk to you about uh, the development of a, the tuba as a solo instrument. Cool. I, this is this is totally new to me. I am I am completely unfamiliar with the tuba. So. You you are not alone, <laughs> if that's any comfort. Uh, the thing is that the tuba is a fairly new instrument as a solo instrument. Although it was invented in 1836, as a matter of fact, it's the only instrument on the planet that we know the exact birth date of. Really? So it was the 12th of September, 1836, that someone made a patent on what they called a tuba. Huh. And, and who do we know who the someone was? Yeah, his name is uh, Wilhelm Wieprecht, a German inventor. He, he was fighting uh, with uh, Sax, another uh, inventor he, who invented the saxophone, uh -huh. who could invent the best instruments at that time. And uh, he was the guy who invented the tuba. That's so cool. So tell me about the instrument itself. Like, like how big is the tuba and how heavy is it because it looks massive yes uh it's very important though to remember that there are different types of tubas oh. uh, normally in the american marching band you have the sousaphone which is more or less wrapped around the player and it goes up like a chimney and points forward with this huge circular bell pointing towards the audience. Now, that's what you use when you're marching, but when you're playing on a concert stage, you normally use an upright bell that points up to the ceiling. And those come in four different sizes, you could say. The biggest one being the B-flat. They're, they're tuned differently. And then comes the C-tuba, and then comes the E-flat tuba, which I play, and then comes the F-tuba, which is the smallest one. Okay. And they differ from... Well, I think the smallest tuba can be around uh, 18 pounds to the biggest ones, which are close to maybe 30 pounds. So what, like if you're a kid and you decide you're going to play a tuba and you're like, you know, 10 years old, like what, what tuba are you going to play? I think uh, E flat is a good choice because it's generally smaller. It's more easy to handle than the large ones and mm. uh, it, it doesn't weigh as much and uh, it's it's literally easier to to get started on it and and what do you as a tall man play i do play the e flat still do, i guess do you I really? get, <laughs> yeah i didn't develop from that is that now, when i was watching the youtube videos is that what you're playing that's exactly it. God, well, it still looks so huge. <laughs> <laughs> it's not more than I think about Mm, let me see. We use kilos here in Europe, so I have to translate. Um, I think it's around 16, 17 pounds or so. Okay. okay. It's not too bad. Wow. So every instrument has its own special repertoire of music. Like what, what do young tuba players who are, you know, learning the instrument, what do they, what do they play? Uh, the first 
things they play are normally, you know, the bass lines in orchestras or wind bands, which sounds like this. Boom, 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 which I'm sure everyone is familiar with. <laughs> yeah. Now, when they advance from that, they perhaps make some simple melodies like boom, 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 beep, boom, 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 something like this. You know, typical yeah. German style Lederhosen music, you could say, marches and things. <laughs> Umba. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Now, when a, when a student starts getting a little bit more serious, the first thing you always play is the Vaughan Williams Tuba Concerto. And I was hoping we could listen a little bit to the first movement of that concerto. Okay. That's so light and bouncy for tuba. <laughs> yes, it's actually quite revolutionary when it came in 1954. It was it was very different than the tuba music that came before it. Yeah, it was uh, literally no solos available at all before this came. Wow. So this piece was written to the anniversary of the London Symphony Orchestra and uh -huh. uh, Juan Williams was about 81 years old at this time. Wow. So this was this was the first time that tuba players who wanted to do any sort of solo work didn't have to like um, to take something that was meant for another instrument and and like rewrite it for the tuba. Right, right. So yeah. this is a, a very very famous original piece, and actually it's the most famous tuba concerto ever. And Is this, like, what what drew you to the tuba? Why did you start playing? And, and was this, like, what you first started learning on? It was actually a coincidence. It's the It was the only instrument available when I started in the wind band, so I, I had to pick the tuba or nothing. It was pretty <laughs> simple. <laughs> tuba or nothing. Tuba or nothing. <laughs> That's awesome. So this, <laughs> the fact that they needed a tuba player completely changed the course of your life. <laughs> you could say so. That's amazing. Which, uh, yeah, you know, it's a lot of coincidences in one's life. So this is one of the major ones for me, I guess. Yeah. But it turned out I liked it very, very much. Uh, it sort of fitted my voice very well. And uh, I could... Uh, uh, Well, I felt really at home with the sound of the tuba. Yeah. How old were you? When I started playing the tuba, I was 15 years old. Okay. Which is fairly old, actually, when you compare it to a lot of other instruments, like violin players starting when they're three or they four actually, years old. They start in the womb. It's yeah. <laughs> 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 In the beginning, I was very, very influenced by some American tuba players. For example, one of my really big heroes was Harvey Phillips. Harvey Phillips. Harvey Phillips, he is the first brass player ever to be elected into America's Musical Hall of Fame. Wow. Yep. And that happened just, let's see, six years ago, I think it was. Cool. Yep. Very, very special. And... Um, He meant very much to me. I listened to his recordings, you know, on the LPs that we had back then. I tried yeah. to copy his style of playing. And actually, in 1994, I had the opportunity to go study for him at Indiana University for a month or two. Whoa. That was very, very uh, rewarding and exciting. can hear now is, for example, the John Williams Concerto, a little bit different style. Uh, 
this is the same composer who actually wrote the Star Wars and oh, Indiana yes. Jones and all that. Yeah, he's he's one of my personal favorites. Notice how we make now how he mixes uh, the more fluent style, more sort of cantabile or singing qualities. As, oh, is that what that means? As, yeah, cantabile. Cantabile means singing. Okay. So canto comes from Italian canto, which means song. Yeah, it sounds like he's really playing around with like, like how high and how low the instrument can go. It's very That's playful, great. very yeah. playful, and a little bit like fiddle-ish, a uh, little bit uh, resembling um, American folk music in a way, that chitty, 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 uh -huh. that type of style. Yeah. And here comes the cantabile, the singing again. Musicians generally love playing John Williams' music. Well, it's fun. Yes. It, you just imagine yourself flying through space in the Millennium Falcon. <laughs> That's exactly <laughs> it. <laughs> in, uh, so uh, it's much more advanced than the one written in uh, 1954. Of yeah. course, everyone knows by this time that t the tuba can do a lot of fancy stuff, so he utilized that. Right. That was actually one of the questions I was going to ask you. What is it that the tuba can do that other instruments can't? Like, every instrument has its, like, secret thing that it can do that no one else can. Right. Well, I think you can be pretty safe when you're saying that my piece called the fnug is yeah. something that nobody else can do. This it's, is the coolest. It's, yeah, it's, it's a piece that sort of I invented slowly and it emerged eventually as a complete piece, but it started by just playing around with different techniques. Yeah, I was going to ask you, like, what inspired you? Because when I, when I first heard this, I was, I was super entertained, first of all. And then second, I thought, this sounds like like a one-man marching band, like mixed with a Tuvan throat singer. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's exactly it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, what I do is I, I sing at the same time as I'm playing in the tuba. Yeah. Which, which is uh, this effect you can call multiphonics. That's sort of the scientific word of it. It sounds yeah. a lot more fun than than what it the word multiphonics sounds like. But uh, and then I use something called lip beat. Let's see if I can actually do that on the mic here. Okay. So it's a little bit like um, beatboxing, you That's could it. say. Yeah, I was going to see that. very like bouncy and like I was dancing in my office while I was listening to this and I, was, I wondered if you were inspired by like other forms of music like rock or like where oh, you yeah. got this from well definitely I think even in classical music there is a there is a, a truth that rhythm will always make people excited because there is something with this heartbeat thing that sort of makes you want to move, and it's so it's so um, deep inside us that that we should really utilize this when we're playing classical music as well. Don't be afraid to sort of let things swing. Yeah. Oh, I don't want to call this classical music, though. No. I've actually played this piece on a couple of radio shows, which usually play only rock. Really? Yeah. But the fun thing is nobody nobody hears that it actually is a tuba. <laughs> I never I never would have guessed that if I had not known to begin with. It sounds like a like a didgeridoo or or like, you know, something like that. Exactly.
So uh, this piece is is become very very popular around the world. I mean, there's uh, at one point we printed music for it, and that has sold in more than five thousand copies right now, which mm-hmm. is almost unprecedented when it comes to tuba music. It's very fun for me to hear other people play it. As a matter of fact, the first time I heard somebody else play it was on YouTube. That was mm-hmm. when YouTube was new, and my daughter said to me, "Come and have a look at my computer. It's something called YouTube. People record their videos." And and of course, the first thing I did do I searched for tuba and pressed enter, mm-hmm. and up came one video only, and I pressed play. And I heard a Chinese guy talking Chinese, and then he was starting to play <laughs> on his tuba, and it turned out to be my piece. He was playing my piece <laughs> wow. on an old B flat tuba in China, <laughs> and <laughs> that awesome. was kind of a kind of a surprise. That that must have been really cool. It, yeah, I noticed that other people, like when I when I went to search for your video, there were there were a bunch of uh, copycats. Oh yeah. So you you invented this technique, Fanuk. Have other people started doing other things with it, or? Yep, uh, that's part of the fun. I think that some people are inventing sort of add-ons to it, their own style of playing it, their own tempo. Maybe some, if you're a woman playing it, you might want to sing it a little bit higher, for example, because uh-huh. of the voice. And uh, some people have actually added it, uh, video shows to it and light shows and they've uh, added other instruments like uh, drums for example and samplers and beats and everything and uh, it's really cool to see how it emerges and that uh, people can waste a lot of time <laughs> playing with this piece <laughs> I know that you l- used to listen to jazz and, uh, or, or rock uh, yeah. I listened to some of your programs before so I know that and uh, that was also one of my other influences. You see, I don't really mix between musical styles. There's so many similarities when it comes to expression and character. So it's not really necessary to define that this is classical, this is neoclassical, and then comes contemporary and so on. Right. I, I feel if it gets your your blood flowing faster um, and it gets you excited then it's good music and that's all I care about. I totally agree. I think that, and I'm, I'm really surprised because before I started learning about classical music on this show, I kind of thought that classical musicians wouldn't be that sort of open-minded about music. It seems like this secret society that you have to know, you know, the secret handshake to get into. And I'm surprised to find out that actually a lot of classical musicians like yourself are big fans of other genres of music. And like you, you, I read, actually record with jazz musicians and rock musicians. Yeah. And another one of my influences were Blood, Sweat and Tears. They had a fantastic live album with a tuba solo on the album. which was uh, just fabulous. Uh, Everyone listened to that at that time. And I actually transcribed the whole thing and practiced on it for half a year to try to copy what that that tuba player was doing. Uh, So I learned a lot doing that. That's awesome. Well, this is this is like this is a very sort of atypical thing for a tuba player to do, and you're a tuba soloist, like solely. This is what you do. Can you tell me what a typical tuba player's career looks like, and then talk to me about like what, why you decided to do something different? Okay. So the typical professional tuba player, which we have quite a few of actually, they play in symphony orchestras or in military wind orchestras. That's usually where they find a job. Or you have also some people who are working as teachers. Now the job in a symphony orchestra is more or less counting rests because you're not playing all the time. As a matter of fact, you're playing very little of the time Mm -hmm. and you are just counting bars until you can come in and play uh, some more again. So when I was working in the symphony orchestra, um, I got tired of this. 
Of course, there's <laughs> there's some parts where you play beautiful things together with the trombones and the rest of the orchestra, but it was too little for me. I, I needed to be more in charge of the whole musical aspect. So I chose to quit the job in orchestra and go playing my own things. Mm -hmm. And I've never regretted that, actually. Well, it seems like you've got so much creative freedom. So so tell me about your um, crazy rock and roll lifestyle. So I assume <laughs> you toured with like Guns N' Roses back in the early 90s and... Like uh, exactly, exactly. <laughs> no, I, but in the early 90s, I was doing another crazy thing. I was playing with a, a, a punk band called Cod Lovers in Sweden. And we were going <laughs> to do a, a concert on a disco in uh, Stockholm, I think it was. And we had the sound check in the morning. Everyone was happy. And then we went. We left the instruments there at the disco and we went each to our different places. And then the evening when the concert came, the band was there and I came a little bit late and I was stopped in the door by the guard. And he said, so where's your ticket? Ticket? I, I don't have a ticket because I play here. Yeah, and what do you play? He said, I play tuba with the Cod Lovers <laughs> punk band. I and he was just laughing and said, okay, we've had people saying that they play guitar with them and they play <laughs> piano and whatever, but tubo, that was a new one. Now go and get your <laughs> ticket. Uh, and I was a little upset by this, so I was uh, uh, beginning to sort of try to pass him anyway, and he sort of went for help, and they, it was a little, like, fuss upstairs when, uh, when he went to get someone else to help me being thrown out and then the band leader was up there and he could confirm that i actually did play the tuba with the cod lover so that concert went real well when i eventually got into the disco <laughs> and you avoided <laughs> a fist fight <laughs> i avoided the fist fight i was ready though <laughs> <laughs> you're ready to go <laughs> that's awesome that's, that's the best rock and roll tuba story and also the only rock and roll tuba story i have ever heard <laughs> So, um, are there other tuba players who are starting to kind of follow in your footsteps? Absolutely. There are some that are maybe working half-time as a teacher, and then they travel as a soloist the uh, other half-time, and they sort of want to make it more gradually than I did. Mm -hmm. and I really welcome more people doing this, but as Harvey Phillips once said, every tuba player who plays a solo on a stage represents every other tuba player on the planet. And what he means by that is that most people, like yourself, for example, haven't heard a tuba play a solo before. So when somebody comes out on the stage and play for audiences who haven't heard it, they literally shape their entire view on the tuba as a solo instrument forever. Mm. And that affects everyone else who play the tuba as well. Because yeah. if they heard a really bad performance, they will never, ever come back and listen to a tuba play again. Because they, they don't blame the person, they blame the instrument. Right. If it's a bad performance. Now, on the other hand, if it's a very good performance, the audience will have a good idea about the tuba and a good feeling about it. And then it, perhaps they will come back and listen to it again. God, that's a lot of pressure. It is. <laughs> <laughs> You're representing the entire tuba community. That's exactly it. And it is a lot of pressure, but um, I think you, everyone can get away with it if they choose pieces which are not too hard for them and which they feel very comfortable with and which they feel they can really communicate and, and deliver beautifully. Mm -hmm. And uh, if, you, if you're a high school tuba player, you just started, just pick something simple and uh, learn it really, really well and go out on the stage and have fun. That is the best recipe for success. Yeah. Not to grasp uh, one of those really hard ones and 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 almost make it. <laughs> <laughs> Listen to one of my other heroes, which is Roger Bobo playing a Roger... more contemporary piece. Okay. Yeah, his name is Roger Bobo. He comes from Roger Bobo. Los Angeles, I think. He, at least he played in Los Angeles Symphony for a long time.
it's more contemporary, you could say. Composer really using the full range here. The tuba can get so, like, guttural. Yeah, it's very physical. Yeah. Almost brutal at some times. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But then it, it can change course and be so light. Like, exactly. I, I saw um, another video of you playing, and I can't, I can't remember what piece it was, but I was, I was so surprised by how light and, and sort of airy the notes were. This is a, a piece that you have to have some peace and quiet when you listen to uh, these encounters too by William Kraft that we're listening yeah. to right now. So I recommend that if you're really curious, go out and find that. I've also done a recording of it. Um, William Kraft is a composer. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's kicking off again. And then try it out, see if it's something for you. So what we're going to listen to now is uh, Chardas by Vittorio Monti, since you mentioned the light notes. This is a, a piece that is written for violin, okay. and it's really, really fast. And I was thinking maybe it's possible to do also on the tuba. So I practiced, and I'm sure it was. So this is a recording I did with a Swedish string orchestra in 2003. This is Hungarian music, really like uh, fiery uh, folk music from Hungary. I can hear that. The f folk. Soon we'll kick off with a real fast playing here. Okay, here we go. You want to dance again? Oh yeah, no, we're totally <laughs> dancing in the studio right now. <laughs> that is awesome. So this is the fun part about playing the tuba, when you're playing stuff that is originally for violin, uh -huh. and you can, uh, you can sort of prove to the audience that it's also possible on the tuba. It's pretty fun to watch their faces when they hear this for the first time sometimes. <laughs> that I meant to ask you before when we were talking about why you decided to go solo was is it, you know, you made this decision and have clearly made a really interesting and varied career um, out of being a solo artist, but is it more difficult to be solo than to be affiliated with an institution? Yes, I believe so. And um, the reason being that you have to 
be on top of the game all the time. Uh, when you're in the orchestra, you can have a bad day and you can uh, sort of rely on all the other hundred persons in the orchestra to pull most of the, the, the cart for you. But when you are on your own as a soloist, you're exposed all the time to the smallest atom, what you're doing on the front of the stage there. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, that is it's a it's a very high pressure on you and also there's a financial pressure of being all on your own it's pretty much like running your own business yeah. being self-employed which you know has its upsides but also it, it's it's a lot of pressure yeah i imagine Yes, I just wanted to show you a piece where the tuba has a totally different role, where it's more um, singing. Yeah. This is a song I wrote myself. I didn't know you were also composed. Yeah, the more gentle side of the tuba. Uh huh. <laughs> the gentle side of tuba. It's not really about the size of the instrument. It's more about what you have in your mind when you create the music. Yeah, it sounds almost like a like a gentle giant in this piece. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Nice. So I'm looking at the CD cover for the CD that the piece we're listening to comes from, <laughs> uh, and and it's on the on the cover. There's a photo of you leaning on your tuba, as one does, uh, and in the background there's a boat that's positioned just so on a lake. Oh yeah. So how long did you guys have to wait for a tugboat to pass <laughs> behind you? <laughs> <laughs> It's actually a ferry, and oh, it ferry. Took, yeah, yeah. You know, we actually to get the right light and everything. We waited. I think we spent two hours there, and it's one ferry every thirty minutes. So we got four ferries coming and going uh, during that period, and finally we got some good shots. <laughs> it's one one ferry every every how long? Uh, every half hour. Every half hour. So they had, <laughs> so got shots of like four. <laughs> so well, that's uh, the fairy tale CD. The, Fairy tales. Oh, yeah, duh. I said tugboat. Tugboat <laughs> tales. Not nearly as sexy. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't work as well. I know. No. So, like, what kind of projects are you working on now? Well, uh, there's a new CD coming out in uh, during the summertime, you know, which is going to contain my own tuba concerto, which I wrote myself, and Kristan Lindbergh's tuba concerto, and Jon Eivind Ness, another Norwegian composer's concerto. Now... As for touring, I go to Poland, and I go to India, and then immediately after that, I go to Ottawa in Canada. <laughs> and immediately after that, I go down to Indiana in the US, where I will participate in nothing less than a world conference for tuba players. <laughs> <laughs> okay, is, and like, how many people are at the world conference for tuba players? I think there will be something around 800 people oh from my God. all over the world. Yeah, That's a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but still, it's just a fraction of all the tuba players that that yeah. uh, do that. You know, could have been there, but uh, it's it's the most interested one. And uh, professionals, and they play everything from rock on the tuba, jazz on the tuba, pop on the tuba. Uh -huh. They play. Um, uh, they play uh, like classical, of course, experimental. Mm -hmm anything. Wow, that's super cool. 
<laughs> well, Oystein Batsvik, thank you so much for being on our show all the way from Norway. I forgot to ask you what time it is there. Um, now it's like 9.45 p.m. in, in Norway. Okay, and we're looking at, yeah, 2.45 here. Yeah. Well, yeah, thanks for being on the show in the evening instead of doing other nice things like that you could be doing at home, like watching TV. Yeah, that's very useful. <laughs> it is. It's very useful. <laughs> no, I'd rather talk to you, actually. <laughs> Aw, go on. All right, well, that's it for our show, everybody. If you'd like to learn more about Classical Classroom, just go to houstonpublicmedia.org backslash classroom. If you would like to send me an email with comments, concerns, or congratulations, just send it to dclay at houstonpublicmedia.org, and I'll write you back something witty and awesome. If you want to follow us on SoundCloud, you can also do that. It's soundcloud.com backslash classical classroom, and on that SoundCloud page, you can actually see a full listing of all of our shows. If you want to, you can subscribe to us on iTunes. Uh, If you do... Make sure to rate and review us because, gosh darn it, it's the nice thing to do. Thanks to producer Todd Tall Texan Holslander for twiddling knobs, to our program director Sinjin Flynn for being a great overlord, to Oystein Bosvik for being with us all the way from Norway, uh, to me for saying many fine words. Thanks to you for listening. And we'll catch you next time.